speaker tonight, Steve White, and he's going to talk on the reliability of the Old Testament. So over to you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I've noticed over the uh, two years that we've been meeting here that much of the time we've been debating the reliability of the New Testament. Uh, one or two allusions, the Old Testament, no doubt about it. Ray, of course, took us to uh, look at the possibilities of a flood uh, what, four weeks ago, I think it would have been. But uh, I had it on my mind that I'd like to look also at the Old Testament. Uh, for many Christians, um, the revelation of what God's doing is not just confined to the 26 books we say in the New Testament, but indeed goes back to what we know as the 39 books of the Old Testament, the Jewish Scriptures. So um, that's what I plan to look at at night. I should add briefly a bit about my background. And uh, it was interesting last fortnight when we had both um, Matt and uh, Laurie talking, uh, and it's probably come out a few other times that much there is a subjectivity to where we come from, so I should briefly mention that uh, because of a somewhat unhappy marriage between my mum and my dad, my mum got to a point where she really cried out to God. She was a church girl, but she cried out to a God she heard about, and to her she had an experience of faith, and, and that, as I was an eight-year-old at the time, was something that flowed over her children. And I have to say, from about the age of eight onwards, I did start to pray and read the Bible, and from that time on, I guess I never really doubted it. So I do come with my own subjectivity. I'll, I'll fess up right from the front. Having said that, um, I also went on to, uh, with, uh, with things that the work I did, that I, I applied for and gained entry to the Air Force uh, after completing uh, my high school into the Air Force Academy, the predecessor to the Australian Defence Force Academy, um, which came, um, ADFA came in about 1980, but prior to that there were each of the uh, individual service colleges, and uh, at that stage the Air Force Academy down at Point Cook is, um, was a college of the University of Melbourne, and because of what we did, we didn't apply, um, the bias in our studies in the science degree was for upper atmosphere physics. Uh, you couldn't really select subjects apart from what they gave you, so that tends to be my background. Uh, anything postgraduate thereafter was really done within the confines of the Air Force or the Royal Air Force in, in one instance over at Cranwell. Uh, so I can't quote any further um, studies beyond what the Air Force um, gave me or, or made me go on during that time. So that's where I come from. But I have always, as I say, read the Old Testament as well as the New and had an understanding was correct, but with the inquisitive mind of uh, uh, having a science degree, I did look at the facts. And so what I propose to propose to prepare tonight is a layman's point of view in terms of what I can present, because I'm not, I'm certainly not um, in any way an expert on this, but what I've read. And so we'll go through what I can, and obviously <coughs> on such a large subject, I'm only really going to touch lightly on a few of the topics. I will try to make my emphasis on Genesis 1 to 11, because I appreciate that can be the most controversial part of the Old Testament. So let's go forward then. First of all, what are the Old Testament scriptures? Well, I've chosen to quote the words that Jesus is reported to have said at the end of Luke there, in which he talks about the prophets, the Psalms, or the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. If we break those down further, and I'll give you a website there to look for it, the law of Moses, the Hebrew Torah, comprises the books we know as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. <coughs> The prophets comprise Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joshua, Judges 1 and 2, Samuel 1 and 2, uh, 1 and 2 Kings rather, 1 and 2 Samuel, and 12 minor prophets. And then the Psalms, they're also known in the Hebrew um, scriptures as the writings, as Psalms, Proverbs and Job, Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes and Esther, and then what otherwise we might have considered some of the minor prophets, Daniel. Ezra and Nehemiah are also one and two chronicles. Now, as we add them up, that comes to the 39 books we recognise. Now, it's true to say that some Hebrew scriptures, some of them emerge. I believe one and two chronicles were once merged into one book. So, if you go back, you won't always find the 39, but broadly speaking, 
That is what we know as the Old Testament. Generally speaking, I'm sure there might be others who can go better, is that the criticism of the Old Testament and its uh, reliability was that much of the law of Moses, that is the first five books, were written during or after the Jewish Babylonian exile in the 6th century BC. And in fact, they were based on uh, other legends from Babylon and Assyria. And these have since been corrupted with establishment of embellishments uh, over centuries of copying. And that in fact, because in fact they were copies of other legends, there are other legends out there in the Old Testament, particularly the first five books, are just repeats, uh, particularly Genesis, of, of other um, legends and indeed maybe only one of competing ones. So we can't, well how do you know the Old Testament? You believe the Old Testament? Well I believe this or that. Who knows what's right? That is just a broad overview of why the Old Testament is often not uh, regarded with much uh, reliance or indeed as much uh, reverence um, these days as it once was. I should remind you though that Peter, around about 65 AD, did actually predict that this would happen. Uh, I won't leave that up there for long, but we noticed that he said that people say, well, Jesus is coming back again, he's not, it's all that he's going on. They'll forget what was said, they'll forget about the words of the, the flood and the other things that happened. Finally though, uh, I guess it's that final paragraph there, God's not slow to carry out his promises. However, some people, however, some people think he is that might be slow. Instead, God is patient. He wants all people to give up their evil ways. God does not want to destroy anyone, but Jesus will certainly return one day. And that is the hope of Christians. Uh, so we do <coughs> know that Peter, many years ago, said that people would doubt everything that was called previously. And so in one sense, I say, well, yep, Peter saw it was happening. Uh, I shouldn't be um, disappointed if people doubt it today. Now, where are we going to quote my sources from? Well, of course, we have that great um, omnipotent uh, fount of wisdom, Wikipedia, <laughs> which I will refer to. Um, it, it's generally a good source. You can find most things, whether it's got much uh, uh, peer review or anything like that. Well, I suppose it's got the whole world peer review in it, um, because they do actually allow for that. So I will quote that. I'm also quoting Apologetics Press, uh, a, a source where I found quite a bit of detail I'm going to bring out. The Bible I use is an archaeological study Bible. It's got the scriptures in it, but interleaved there are different comments, and these comments, among other things, bring out the archaeological references to what is being described there. I'm going to quote a professor uh, of Egyptology at Liverpool University who wrote a book, 2003. Uh, reliable of the Old Testament, and particularly a Dr. Clifford Wilson. Now, yeah, Shane Laurie isn't here because uh, I think I might have slightly upstaged Laurie. This guy was a senior lecturer in psychology uh, at uh, Monash University, and uh, also he was a multi talented uh, gentleman. He just passed away about five or so years ago. He was also into psycholinguistics and education with degrees in humanity, archaeology, and theology. Uh, probably down the second bullet point down below there, he's probably main kind of Did everyone remember Eric von Daniken, mm. Charisma of the Gods? <laughs> who wrote this um, book claiming that a lot of the archaeological uh, magnificent things that we see, I think there was lines on the desert out in South America by the Incas or the, in Peru somewhere and, and various other things were all yes. done by um, visitors from the, um, in spacecraft many, um, many thousands of years ago. Um, Clint Wilson's main claim to fame is he wrote the rebuttal of it called Crash Go the Chariots. Uh, I should add that he did become a believer in the young earth, and I'm not going to quote that too much here, but he spoke to a physicist, um, a professor of physics at um, University of Texas, and that at least informed some of his views on why he went on to um, argue the case for at least some of the, his belief in, in Genesis. Right, this is the if you like the other few, what I'm going to talk about, about now? One, we're going to look at the evidence of the Dead Sea Scrolls on the accurate copying, copying and early origin of Hebrew scriptures. We'll look briefly at some internal evidence from Daniel. We're then going to look at uh, the Sinai Covenant, which basically means the Hebrew law, uh, and why it was not written, or why it was written, around about the time, reportedly it was supposed to be at the time of the Exodus. 
<coughs> we'll look for external evidence for historic accuracy of Genesis chapters 10 to 11, that is the post-flood time frame. We're then going to look at, uh, no, I'm going to skip the flood because Ray's already done that one or is in the process of doing it. Then we're going to look at external evidence for historical accuracy of Genesis chapters 4 to 5. Now, that's probably the big one that uh, I'm not, in fact, I'm not going to go too much into that. That's the one, obviously, that bears most argument. And finally, I wish Ian was here because he quoted Oregon and, um, and also uh, Augustine about their doubt in the uh, veracity of the um, of the young earth and I uh, dug up some quotations from which I think at least balance the viewpoint that I think uh, Ian presented there uh, a few months ago. Right, let's talk the Dead Sea Scrolls. Has anyone been to Israel? Okay, so you've been to the Dead Sea? Yes, you but do. Not right. You have, okay. Well, um, it's a very bleak place down there, the Dead Sea, isn't it? If you've been down, you've seen it's, it's really deep. I was there about six months ago, but um, no, um, the story, and I'm sure most of you know it, about November 1946, an Arab shepherd boy was looking for his goats, flock of goats. He couldn't find some of them. He came to a cave, he threw a rock down, trying to scare him out. There was a, a clinking and a crashing rather than just a rumble of a rock blowing. And, and we all, as we know, he discovered some jars. In there were some scrolls, and other scrolls continued and being uh, found until about 1956. Uh, we think the scrolls were hidden by a group called the Essenes. They are an exclusive apocalyptic sect ruled by um, a leader called the Teacher of Righteousness. Those scrolls are about 972 texts altogether. Uh, in those days, Hebrew was written in consonants only, so you didn't have any vowels. 40% uh, of those texts are from the Hebrew Bible. Part of every book except Esther, you may know that Esther is the one book in the Old Testament which doesn't um, describe, doesn't mention God, so perhaps that was the reason it was excluded. 30% of texts are from other books from the second te temple period, not in the 39 books, but some of them have religious significance. And indeed, we know the book of Jude in the New Testament quotes the book of Enoch, which is one of the books that was discovered amongst those scrolls. And then the remainder are secular texts, mainly on day-to-day -day Essene rules or the rules of the community that was down there. Now, they were dated approximately, according to this references, but it's approximately between 400 BC and 135 AD. Now, the way they did it, well, there are at least two things that I'll, I'll bring out. One is the shape and style of the letters. And then secondly, the coins, and if you get a coin with a, a figurehead of a, a rule, then you can pretty well say, and it was mixed in with the, uh, the scrolls, you can pretty well say, well, you could date that scroll from the time when that ruler was there, and it was that particular ruler uh, from the Greek um, rulers of uh, Syria at the time. Palatology, shape and style of letters, I, I thought of that, you can see some were prior to Hasmonean, which they called archaic style, some of the Hasmonean style, Again, just a reminder, Hasmonean rulers were the, uh, the Hebrew rulers who rebelled against the Greek rule and took over and reigned in uh, Judea between approximately uh, 160 BC through to about uh, the time Herod took over, about 30 BC. And then from 30 BC onwards, we have the Herod and Herod came to rule in Judea. As I reflect, even on my own life, um, I remember learning to write in the 50s at, high, at uh, primary school by dipping a pen in an inkwell. I'm really dating myself now. Some of you are smiling, you remember that, and writing that way. Uh, probably a few years after that, I started writing with a fountain pen. Uh, I can recall that I wrote in cursive script. My parents wrote in copper plate or something equivalent. So even in that time frame, you can start to date over a few decades, which decade was I writing in? And you may even remember the first um, word process that came out um, with impact typewriters with a, a ribbon, so you could say that's an impact typewriter, and that was probably mid 80s when I first started to use a PC. Later on, you got ink jets and you got your bubble jets and you got a, whatever. So I would suggest, even if you look over the last 100 years, you could probably date a document with reasonable accuracy to within a decade or two, just on the development of writing in our own time frame. Same with that as well. 
Now, prior to 1946, the oldest Hebrew Bible uh, was called the Masoretic Text, and it was propped around about 1000 AD. I've seen various ones. I think the one at 9 AD was not a complete one. They say, I think there's the one from, uh, I think it was from St. Petersburg or somewhere that might have, a complete one might have been 9, uh, 1080 AD. But thereabouts, about 1000 years ago, we had the, the <coughs> last book of the Old Testament, the last full Old, uh, Old Testament. It was written in Hebrew in a style that had added vowels by that stage. About 600 AD, the Masoretes were a name of a, of a scribe group in Hebrew, in the Jewish community, which would uh, pass on as best they could the pronunciation by adding the vowels. And they also added checksums, uh, I believe, or the small marks at the side of each of their pages and each of their lines to make sure they were copying as accurately as they could. They really developed a, sky, uh, a skill to do that. And that particular text is the basis for, if you were to open your English Bible, that's the basis for what you read in the Old Testament, those 39 books. Now, how do we relate that to the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yeah, sorry, do you mean the authorised version? The authorised version. The King James Version, but even uh, as I looked at mine's an NIV Bible, it says that that is largely based. In fact, I think you'll find the Masoretic Text is also used even in the modern translation, well, perhaps except for the Message or some of those. Um, certainly, I know the NIV and the New American Standard are also based with one or two variations in relatively limited parts where they take account of what the, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls might provide a different. But the Masoretic Text, around about 1000 AD, is the basis for most of the, what can I say, the conservative translations, even in today's English Bibles as well, except for perhaps the very paraphrased ones where there's a bit more license used. Right, uh, back to where I was. Now, of the Bible text that we do find in those uh, that were there, 60% <coughs> of the Comron Bible texts are classed as being proto into Now, I've got to add the word proto. Remember, we're now comparing ones without vowels to those with vowels that we find in the 1000 AD. But approximately 60% are correlated um, for those of the linguistics, the basis of what we actually find in the 1000 AD. Particularly the Pentateuch, the first five books, and particularly some of the prophets, uh, especially Isaiah, and we'll look at Isaiah shortly. 20% is in the Comron style based on the Masoretic text. Slight differences there. Uh, I don't fully understand that. 5% um, is the Samaritan Pentateuch. Remember the Samaritans were a group in northern uh, Israel that were a mixed race, but we won't go too far down that at the moment. And then finally there is 5% in the Greek style. I just wanted to show you the, the cross, the correlation again, that much of the early part of the Bible, the Pentateuch, which is the the first five books, as well as a number of the prophets, particularly Isaiah, do have a quite a close correlation to what we read a thousand or about a thousand AD. Have I gone too far? Yeah, you you are going to yes, I just did that. Right, I was just going to give you the comparison. Um, for anyone here that doesn't know the Old Testament, um, but I'll just briefly mention the book of Isaiah in particular gives a number of prophecies, has a number of prophecies to the New Testament and to, to who was coming as the Jewish Messiah and in particular for Christians Isaiah 53 is a very special one which describes um, and we're about to read it someone who suffers on behalf of others takes the blame for others and dies but continues to live but just as a brief summary I'll go back up in the front there the Comron Isaiah scrolls a 95% match to the Masoretic text and reduces the gap to Isaiah's original from 1700 years to about 500 years. So suddenly we've got this 1200 year um, gap that we've now closed and that 5% we can establish is mainly difference to spelling errors. And I'm going to quote in particular that verse down towards the bottom there which many Christians would be aware of. Of the 166 Hebrew words in Isaiah 53, only 70 letters are different from the Masoretic text. And of those differences, 10 are spelling differences, 4 are style changes, and finally, 3 uh, extra uh, words actually were added 
in verse 11. And I'm just going to read that. After the suffering of his soul, he will see life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. That's the translation from the New International Version. Now what the Masoretic text did was add the light of the light of to that whole sentence. And to me, and I hope I'm being objective here, I can't see that adding those three words make any difference to the meaning of that particular sentence. It seems to be the changes, and I'll just use that as an example, um, really were relatively minor. Now, of course, if you go through all the others, maybe you can find others that are slightly more significant. But certainly Isaiah, and I, perhaps I've cherry picked, I'll acknowledge that. Isaiah in particular is a very good, uh, a very good example. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that we get a very accurate rendition of Isaiah from much close to its time of writing to the time that we can actually read it. And we have an assurance, and for those that have been in uh, engineering, uh, not only I was in the Air Force, I was also in the defence industry, so it's good to meet Kevin, uh, even though I'm retired now. And certainly the, the mantra, whenever you're in production, is, is quality assurance. I'm sure it's the same in, in other things as well. Make sure that you've got repeatable performance, that you can make a design and then be able to repeat it properly, and so that it comes out exactly as you intended. Well, certainly quality assurance, if I use that expression, of the Old Testament uh, was highly effective in preserving the meaning of Isaiah, passed down to us 2,200 years after the, the scrolls, and by, I would say, once you've established that process was actually in working there, in all probability, I, I believe you can extend it further back into time so it comes right up close to when Isaiah actually wrote the book, wrote his prophecies down, or maybe one of his scribes wrote it down, with a high degree of, you know, reasonable, high degree of probability that what we see today is what Isaiah actually prophesied. On the basis of that extension, 1000 AD back to about, uh, back 1200 years. The process was there, we've got reasonable assurance that in fact that's what we were actually reading, what Isaiah actually wrote. Daniel, now Daniel is a major problem for atheists at its face value uh, of a date written when it purports to describe activities in the Babylonian and then the Persian Empire. Just a reminder for those that may not know Daniel, chapters 2, 7, 8, 10 and 12 predict four kingdoms. The Babylonian one he was living in, specifically chapter 7 mentions, uh, no, chapter 8 specifically mentions Persia and Greece to follow as the next major empires, and then there's a final empire to come. Why not five? Why not seven? Why not two? The Bible, uh, Daniel specifically says well, that only four major ones before the Jewish Messiah would come back and <coughs> God's kingdom would be established. But reminder that if it, well, this was written in 6th century BC, at that stage, Babylon and arguably Persia were the power that they could have known about, but certainly Greece and then certainly an unknown city on the banks of the Tiber were way out of the future, hardly conceivable. Uh, chapter 11 mentions uh, a rise that the fourth Persian king would be particularly rich and provoke the Greeks. Um, the fourth king from the time of its writing was indeed Xerxes, who did in fact invade. We, we know the story of um, Thermopylae, we know what happened uh, off the coast of Athens, and we know that the Greeks eventually defeated Xerxes. Uh, that was something like 50 years in advance. The rabbit Fires rise and sun fall of Alexander. Again, you can read there uh, about 200, 350 years in advance. And finally, what at least the Jews themselves knew was this prediction of the Jewish Messiah coming 483 years after the order to re rebuild Jerusalem. And we know that that happened in 445 BC, and in fact, it comes almost right on the time when Jesus of Nazareth appeared on earth. So, a very um, a prophetic book that's got so much in it that you would say, no, no, this can't, it cannot predict, it can't be so accurate. Bible critics predict it had, must have had a second century date for Daniel, particularly because of its description in chapter 11 of the wars between uh, the Syrian and Egyptian dynasties that followed the fall of Alexander. Also, the fact it has Aramaic, and Aramaic by that stage was the lingua franca right throughout the Middle East. But common texts show that by the 2nd century, 
Daniel was, uh, please see that is, Daniel was already recognised as one of the books of the Old Testament. It was accorded the same reverence within the Essene community as the other books, books such as Deuteronomy, Kings, Isaiah and Psalms. It was regarded um, in their writings as on the same path. So it certainly had been given an imprint that would say that it is not a recent thing, but something that already had uh, the accord or rather the, the reverence given to it by its posti by the fact that it was already recognised over some centuries as being a working that was already there. So you're saying they had copies at the time of Antioch? They did. It, that's the point, yes. And I didn't want to go, but you're right. Kevin making the point that because chapter 11 particularly describes um, the overthrow of the final Syrian um, Greek ruler, and the prophecy that that it would not be something therefore um, we could say it would actually be something that you would be writing about but in fact it predicts it in advance and was already had reverence by that stage yes that's what I'm trying to say finally the, oh, the other thing about uh, Daniel it does mention in chapter 5 is the story of how Babylon was overthrown it talks about the king at the time Belshazzar uh, offering Daniel the third uh, place in the kingdom, if you can interpret the writings of the law. Remember, me, uh, for those that may not know, Mimi, Mimi, Tekel, Euphasen, um, number, numbered, way, divided, and which was a, a, was a terms that, by all accounts, Belshazzar understood, but he just didn't know what the sequence of words meant, because it was numbered, numbered, way, divided. Well, what does that mean? Daniel was offered a uh, third place of the kingdom. We know that there was, it was in a great feast, which we have the Greek historians also telling us about the time. How would Daniel know, so how would the writer of the book of Daniel know about the fact that, that, that uh, Belshazzar was in fact co-regent with his father in the <coughs> which was a, an obscure thing by the time of 200 BC, <coughs> if in fact uh, if, how would he know about it? Maybe he could have got Greek writings, but it certainly shows a knowledge of what was happening in the um, Babylonian kingdom at its, its final days there about 539 BC. So that, to me, anyway, is an internal evidence. In fact, in modern times, we didn't know about this guy called Belshazzar until we got from the modern chronicles. It's just one picture of what it looks like. Um, and about 1853. So the fact that the the um, writer of Daniel knew about that, shows that he certainly had a very good um, knowledge of the, uh, or had a, a sound knowledge of what was happening in the last days of Babylon, and gives further evidence that the book of Daniel was written about the 6th century BC. Okay, now let's move on. Dating of the Sinai Covenant. Um, I have to say, Kevin, this was your prompt, as I said, I think, uh, earlier this week. You queried to me, well, how can we be sure that uh, Exodus, Deuteronomy, etc., were all written um, and weren't delayed somewhere down the track? The law wasn't somewhere delayed. Well, what we have is, I believe, some evidence that uh, I was able to look up is the fact that there are three cases where God, God's tree, that one that we gave on the, oh, no, we understand, was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Was, was actually um, given and then repeated. Firstly, we have uh, Exodus and Leviticus, then we had Deuteronomy, where it's more or less repeated in some form, and then finally Joshua repeats it right at the end of Joshua once they've entered the Promised Land. The point being that the, uh, if you look at the format it was, it has a title, Now God Spoke, as an example there, and I've given the three examples three books of where it was. It happens in Exodus 20, now God spoke. Deuteronomy 1, 1 to 5, and also Joshua. It then has a historical prologue. It then has stipulations, including the Ten Commandments. It says where you shall put the text. It says witnesses. <coughs> Moses built 12 stone pillars to represent the 12 um, tribes as a witness to what had just been given by God. It gives some blessings in Leviticus and then some curses. And if we look at the style of covenants, of treaties that were evident that, uh, are, that that is matched on, you find it matches the uh, style given in Hittite treaties of about 1400 to 1200 BC, which again have a title, 
historic prologue, stipulations, deposited text, witnesses, most, they only had curses. Oh, sorry, curses and blessings, that's right, they had curses and blessings as well. Whereas for those that would argue that it was only um, given, Deuteronomy for instance, or indeed any of the others, only given at the time of the Assyrian or maybe the Babylonian uh, times, those didn't have that layer. They were much, uh, they had less in them. There was a title, they had witnesses, they didn't have a historical prologue, they had curses in both those cases and they had speculations, but no witnesses. So certainly the style gives evidence that in fact it matches what was known from the Hittite treaties around about 1400-1200. And thus, it's um, a match to the historical context when you look external to the Bible itself. To say that that gives evidence that it, it matched what was uh, evident at that time. Right, now we've canted through much of the Old Testament. Now we're going to focus on Genesis. Just a reminder Genesis chapter 1. Uh, remember, chapters, to, to be honest, chapters were in fact only introduced. In really only a few hundred years ago. So, what we now know as chapters weren't necessarily in there, but it's a convenient way to be able to give our cross reference. Genesis chapter 1, God's creation of the earth, the universe, and all living things. Genesis chapter 2, uh, specific creation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 3 talks about Satan's temptation to mankind to eat forbidden fruits and rebel, and he rebels against God, resulting in the curse on creation. Genesis chapters 4 and 5, we learn about uh, Adam's uh, son Cain who murders his brother Abel. And then we get a list of the descendants of Adam and Eve. Genesis 6 to 9 has man's wickedness, uh, man in which man's wickedness is judged by the Lord by flood. That's again what uh, Ray's dealt with. I won't go through that. And uh, we have Genesis 10 and 11, which are descendants of Noah. Genesis 12 to 25, which is a, a description or a history of Abraham, Abraham, whose name is changed to Abraham, who seeks God and is called to Canaan. He gives birth to Ishmael and Isaac. And then the remainder of the book of Genesis, we have stories of the remainder of Abraham's descendants through Isaac's son Jacob, who then settled in Egypt. So that's the outline of the book we're going to go through, but we're going to concentrate just on the first 11 chapters with exclusions of six to nine as I say raised the other week. Why do I believe in chapter 11? Well, I believe in it because its customs and names match the era and area that we can look from external sources. Tower of Babel, the ziggurat. The ziggurat. Does anyone um, remind the ziggurat is a big tower? And we'll look at what one looks like shortly. Tower of Babel story comes out in chapter eleven. Just a reminder: the Tower of Babel in the Bible says that that's where God confused the languages of, of the people. At that stage, they all spoke one language, but their language is confused, and they spread out as a result of that confusion of languages. We can see that uh, Shem's generation's timeline matches demonstrated population growth in recent centuries. Uh, I'll talk about DNA evidence that at least indicates that, that uh, it's of the same time scale. And finally, we'll look to some ancient Greek history of the foundation of Babylon to see that chapter 11, which is in all, all is really the time stamp when we believe the flood may have happened, does in fact have some supporting external evidence. Now, firstly, the customs predate, in fact they break what we call the Sinai Covenant, the Mosaic Law, implying that Genesis composition also predates the Jewish law. We, at times when we were discussing the New Testament, why we had some evidence for all, we talked for instance about the fact that it mentions the women coming to give witness to the resurrection. We said, well, you wouldn't do that, that's embarrassing because women were not regarded as reliable witnesses back at that time. So why would you introduce something that wouldn't be expected to be done? It's just not correct. You know, it just wouldn't, unless it was actually what happened. And it's the same here. Why would you put into the book of Genesis something which was later denied by the laws? For instance, Abraham marries his half-sister, Sarah. Or Sarai, as she was then. 
Her name is changed to Sarah. Sarai herself gives her maid Hagar as his concubine to bear an heir. Again, that's not what happened. Um, or would have been prohibited largely by the law, uh, though in fact things like that did happen later, in, as we find out in, in various times in the, in the Old Testament, in, in Israeli history. But finally, Abraham's servant was his heir if Abraham had no son. We know that within the law uh, and in the um, uh, rules given by Moses that um, the land, uh, any land or heir um, given to a, a possession of a certain person was to pass on into his family and his tribe so that the tribal um, ownership of the land was not diluted by things like giving it to a servant or anything like that. So this again was in contradiction of the law. But those laws are consistent, those behaviours are consistent with laws found on tablets in Nutsi in Iraq of the Midnight Kingdom around about 1500 to 1350 BC. They do in fact match the era. They're not inventions of a Babylonian era or indeed of something that was post the law. They, they, the very fact that they contradict the law shows that they appear to be something that was genuine, which was later changed once the uh, Hebrews got the, once the law was given to um, Moses. Let's talk about the area. Um, I understand Brian's about to go there, is that right? You can tell us all about it when you, when you get back. Southeast Turkey has the uh, place is in Haran, is the place where we read that Abraham originally came from. And you'll find if you read the names of the, uh, Abraham's ancestors in chapter 11, you'll find that he had a grand, great grandfather called Serug, a grandfather called Nahor, and a father called Terah. And you'll see there a name that, in fact, there is evidence of place names, either in modern days or going back to Assyrian texts, which match those names. Sarag, Sagi, Surik, 50 kilometers northwest of Haran, even today. Nahor, towns mentioned also in Genesis, but then in other texts, you can see Mari, Cappadocia as well, Assyrian texts, and indeed, uh, there's one called Tel Nutri Mount Nahor. Now, we don't have a modern name for it, but certainly there are textual indications from, uh, that there was that, a place named after Nahor. And finally, Terra, we have uh, Tahari Mount Terra is mentioned in the Syrian text just north of Haran. So, there is evidence there from text, certainly the Bible, that going back three generations, there were places named after names that are in Genesis chapter 11. Okay, now we get to the Tower of Babel. Uh, Tower of Babel being a temple built in around uh, the Mesopotamian area. I have to say it's very tongue in cheek as I look for a picture of a, a ziggurat, I saw Americans on the Tower of Babel. Now I hope I'm not going to offend anyone here but it did occur to me that what with rap artists and indeed general other Americanisms, so confusing the English language that we know and love, it was highly appropriate that I should show Americans descending from the Tower of Babel to, uh, to uh, perhaps confuse our language. Excuse that, uh, that illustration, but it was there, it was, it was on the internet. You'll notice that the description of the Tower of Babel um, do not fit Canaan. Ziggurats are found in Mesopotamia, not in Canaan, so Certainly the description, and you might say, well, they were there in Babel. Well, okay, but uh, during the exile, but certainly it, it mentions in, chapter, in Genesis chapter 11 that the ziggurat, the Tower of Babel is made of brick, tar and water, not of stone. If you go to Israel, you'll certainly know that much of the uh, buildings in Jerusalem and elsewhere are made of sandstone. These materials are actually what comes more particularly in Mesopotamia, not in Israel. So if they certainly knew what materials they're talking about, in the actual context of the area they were describing. Um, even the statement of what they're to build, come let us build a tower that reaches to heaven. Uh, archaeologists today have been able to discover that the names of other towers in that area, in Larsa, for instance, the house of the link between heaven and earth, uh, Borsippa, the house of the seven guides of heaven and earth, and Babylon, the house of the foundation platform of heaven and earth. The very titles themselves of these cigarettes give us a 
strong link to the words of chapter 4 in Genesis 11 where we read that they said, let us build a tower. It's, it's the same name. And so it certainly appears that those who wrote those early verses of chapter 11 knew what they were talking about in terms of the name that was given. And also, of course, of the, from the previous slide, the components that we used to build that. Now, just a brief aside, as we'll delve further and go into the rest of the, the, the chapters, but indeed the rest of chapter 11 as well, a reminder that there is a, um, uh, what's the right word, a harmony, a, a system between chapters 4 and 5 and 10 and 11 as we go through further into Genesis. If I'll start from the beginning, chapter 4 lists the descendants of Adam's son Cain, but without their ages, and it's generally he's describing the background population at the time. We don't read too much about them, we just get their names, but that's all. Whereas chapter 5, the follow-on chapter, lists the line that is going to be preserved right down from Seth to Noah, and we know that then Noah, after the flood, is given orders to repopulate the earth. Now let's look at the same symmetry in chapters 10 and 11. Chapter 10 lists two generations of each of Noah's sons. Like chapter 4, it lists the lineage of the background population of the earth, but without their ages. It's the overall description of the earth's population post the flood. Chapter 11, however, specifically lists Shem's lineage to Abraham with their ages. This is the one that's going to lead through to Abraham who receives the blessing from whom, in fact, both the two of the, in fact, three, all three monotheistic faiths in the world today, the Jewish faith, the Christian faith, and the, the Islamic faith, have their lineage through that. Like chapter 5, it lists the details of the ancestors with whom God makes a new covenant and his promised descendants that will be as numerous as the dust. Chapter 11 um, lists nine generations from Shem, Son of Noah to Abraham, including the ages of the father when each son was born. This amounts to 350 years from the birth of Shem's son Athaxed, two years after the flood, to the birth of Abraham, around about 2000 BC. The world's population was approximately 600 men. Now, okay, let's just put that um, and, and store it right there. By way of comparison, the world's population was approximately 600 million in the year 1650. Remember 1650, we, we knew about the Chinese, we visited them, um, America had been settled, we knew about the populations there. We had, well, the Doomsday Book had been written back 650 years earlier, or 600 years earlier anyway, so we had a reasonable grip on the world's population. By 1950, it had reached 2.4 billion. Quick bit of maths, we, from about 1650 through 1950, we've doubled the population every 150 years. Just a growth of population, just a, a calibration of how quickly the world's population grows. Now, let's go back to Genesis uh, 6 to 11. We read that Noah and his family, eight in total, survived the deluge by biblical timing, if you add the wall, not the years throughout the Old Testament, about 4,500 years ago. That population has to double this is where I slightly updated the slide, Kevin, because I did check the maths. It actually has to update 29.7 times to get the current world's population of 7 billion. I actually got that out of that website there. At the time, they were quoting 6.5 billion, which I presume that website was about four or five years ago as the world population increased. So, but the average comes out about 152 years. You can look and you say, well, maybe the flood wasn't then. But it's certainly plus 150 plus or minus about five years. My point being that reading that timeline that we find in Genesis chapter 11, which is often controversial, uh, no, surely mankind didn't just arise from eight people back uh, 4,500 years ago. Well, from what we know of population growth over the last 300 years, or well, thereabouts, matches the population growth all the way back then. It's consistent. For me, it's one of those Occam Razor um, arguments. The simplest explanation is usually the most effective and most uh, accurate. And to me, that simple maths is fairly convincing. Apart from that, back January last year, uh, I'm not sure how many would have seen this, DNA is something that's starting to emerge, and oh, it struck me that uh, 
Well, we've always believed, and you can read their Max Planck Institute in Germany, established after sampling Indian populations and Pacific folks and then the, and, and Australian Aborigines, there is an, I was actually going to use the Nature website, but they required a copyright approval, which I couldn't get through. It's through that there's about 11% commonality in genes between the Indian population and the others in the, uh, I think, in the uh, sort of New Guinea area and the Australian Aborigine. That those that are into that uh, science can say we've dated uh, Australian Aborigines had a significant, substantial gene flow between the Indian population about 4,000 years ago, and in fact, they even go to say 4,230 years ago, that precision. Again, I won't go to it, but I think we all know that each of us share genes with our mother and our father. We have 50% gene share from each of them. In fact, we have more than that because we've got recessive genes as well. But those are into DNA typing, believe that the Australian Aborigines came out, or sorry, had, and influence from India 4,230 years ago. They, of course, say that it was um, due to actually um, people coming out here, but for those of us that might take a different interpretation, there was a population flow out here 4,230 years ago. I'll leave that to interpretation. Those with a bias towards evolution say, oh, the Aborigines were out here 80,000 years, but it appears as though um, one could make a, a different interpretation. Maybe they were mixed <coughs> as they came out here. And finally, um, in terms of the time frame, I just reminded the Greeks themselves. Um, I think it's C.S. Lewis who said that each generation has an arrogance towards the learning of previous generations. And uh, I'd point out that uh, one would say that Aristotle, you can read it there, there's a, a writing by this guy called Simplicius. Uh, who wrote of what Aristotle had found when he took absolute observations brought back from Babylon. Babylon itself was founded 1903 years prior to when Alexander conquered Babylon. A uh, quick bit of maths, 331 plus 1933, about, about uh, 2230 BC was when Babylon was founded according to observations that Aristotle had found. Right. Okay, so that covers what chapter 11 and why I think there is, in my mind, in my understanding, there is information that I think I could say, yes, chapter 11, <coughs> three or four um, external evidence that uh, certainly support what we read in chapter 11 about the timeline, about the timing when Babylon was found. Then we get to Genesis chapter, t Genesis, Genesis chapter 10. I won't go much here apart from it's a list of names. I say it doesn't have dates, just names. But most of those names are recognisable. Noah's descendants from Israel. Uh, we know today many Egyptians call themselves Al Masri. They, they recognise their descendant from that particular son of, um, of Noah, a descendant of Noah. Uh, it was a, I think it was a grandson. We know that Ebal is a Hebrew, Ashkenazi Jews is another name that comes up. Yav Javan is used elsewhere in the Old Testament for Greeks. We see the lists of the names of the towns uh, and the places. Um, Shinar, Eric, Akkad, uh, all of those are places or, or empires that we recognise today from archaeological studies. We see Babylon and Nineveh, which we know into our history. And then finally, of course, we, the growth of the sun's meets what we know, as I say, from population that I put up in one of those previous slides. So chapter 10 certainly has names we recognise. It's not something that uh, appears to be made up, it's something that we can find out those names. Finally, uh, five minutes to go, should be able to get through this. Now we get to perhaps the one where it obviously most open to the boat, of course, is the uh, chapters four and five. Now we're reading about time before the flood. Surely that's ancient mythology. Uh, how could we believe that? Well, what we do have independent from the Bible is the Sumerian king list. Sumer, by the way, does anyone not understand what Sumer is? Sumer was the very first population, uh, very first empire that seemed to grow uh, and is recognised in many other places as well. Um, as the very first empire that the world knows about. And they wrote this name of kings. Apparently, the, or this uh, particular archaeological Post we can see here originates about 1800 BC, though it talks about kings that go back to Eric, the town that I mentioned, one of the earlier towns, 
uh, approximately early in the third century, um, third millennium. It has a preamble, which is when the kingships were lowered from heaven. It lists a succession of kings, the lengths of their reigns, and the city which they ruled. The king lists, lists an early group of kings who lead extraordinarily long lives, um, just like Genesis chapter 5, where you know, we, we rhyme, but not the same t- uh, not the same as we can interpret, but certainly long lives, and then after a great flood, ones that live shorter but still long lives. Again, matching you know, an, an analogue to what we read in the Bible. So let's turn to what Wikipedia says about this. I trust a secular, um, certainly an open literature account of what this king list is. The king list seems to have a profound influence upon the Hellenistic Greeks and upon the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible. Um, William Hallow demonstrates that the similarity of the names. In Genesis chapter 5, we have the sentence of Cain and then the, the sentence of Seth, Seth. And the king list has names that have very close list, um, a match to those. So the Samaritan king list, and what we read in the early chapters of Genesis, had, some, had matching names as far as someone who's um, there quoted says uh, that. Similarly, when the Thesaurus, the Greek, uh, Babylonian historian about 200 BC wrote it. He also <laughs> quotes names that match a name. Now, I'm, I'm certainly not a linguistic expert, but the person that wrote this in Wikipedia says, Oh, Annas is equivalent linguistically to the Bible name Adam. It's the first one. So, again, we find these parallel accounts, Old Testament, early books of Genesis, are matched by what we find in the King List, right back there. As well as, exa- and then there's further comment, the exaggerated lifespan of Samaritan Kingless seems to be more of an artifact of conversion from the early numerical system based on 360 to a base 10 system for numerical years. There, there is a confusion in how we should interpret those, and maybe those huge ages that we see and often disparage um, for the Samaritan Kingless may actually come quite a lot closer to what in fact this is where I'll quote my. Um, uh, the Australian archaeologist, when correcting using the decimal system, the post flood total of the king list totals only about 200 years <coughs> from that of Genesis. I should add at this stage that there is, and I'll freely admit that we do have a lack of complete precision in the Genesis lists of, uh, of uh, ages. Remember, each one we have the father was in such and such an age and then the son was such and such in years. So we don't know that the son was born on Dad's birthday, or was he born 364 years later? We don't know that. So there is an imprecision in what the Bible says in chapters 4 and 5, or chapters 5 and 11, simply because we only know to the nearest year, and by the time we sum them all up, yes, you can easily reach a 200 year difference there, perhaps. And finally, Again, the time, just to get that there. The early creations account are more probable, are simpler than the less than the more exaggerated accounts later on. And I've, I've said this once or twice before, and it happens even in the New Testament. We find the early gospels are less fantastic, the ones that we have in our New Testament, than the ones that occur such as the Gospel of Thomas, where all sorts of incredible things Jesus does, which and that's why the Gnostic Gospels were were rejected by the early Christian fathers. In the same way, we have some account, early creation account from Ebla, a creation tablet found in Ebla, and describes the work of creation to one great being, the great one who brought creation into being from nothing, it shows, uh, and it tells from the, the commentator who is um, Clinton Wilson, that shows the creation story and the writing of a well known to man up to 1,000 years before Moses' time. Whereas, you can see the bottom account their creation from the Babylonian uh, and Syrian times. In fact, the first Assyrian king there, or that Assyrian king, apparently was one of the first archaeologists and historians that we know of, because he gathered all the, the, uh, the stories that were on tablets and composed them all and brought them all together. And the account, by the time you get to about 700 BC, the earth was created by a god called Aspu and Timat, the salt water ocean. They created other gods, but these displeased Aspu and decided to kill them. He decided to kill them all. Ea and other god heard this, killed Aspu, and then the patron god of Babylon was born. Soon other monster gods arose. Anyway, I'm making the point that if you read the simple 
creation story at the top there, around about 2200 BC, and then the one that had evolved by 700 BC, there's certainly a huge amount of embellishment. Of course, the creation story we find in the first two chapters there, and this is the point I'm making, that just appears to match the simple earliest accounts with a generation or so of nine, about 2200 BC, when Ham and Shem, with their memory of the pre-flood history, and is not some 6th century BC retelling of Assyrian or Babylonian legends. I think I'll end on this slide. I did quote Edward as the, the last evidence I gave. The Edward translation quoted on the previous slides was given at Ann Arbor in 1976 by the Italian professor, you can see his name there, on the Italian team at the site of Edward, which is in northern Syria. It was Dr. Wilson himself who asked, did you see a creation account on the Edward tablets? However, the actual leader of the uh, whole dig at Edward opposed him saying that and contradicted later on. So you might say, well, why am I bringing this up? Well, certainly we do know this. This is 1976. Um, the Syrian authorities have specifically uh, given a letter in writing, which Dr. Wilson had a copy, that the team should make no reference to the Old Testament, in other words, the Jewish Old Testament, or indication that Jewish people are early re uh, relatives of the Syrians. And a reminder that 1976 was three years after Syria was defeated by Israel. We, we know the war is going on there at the moment. So I just make the point that politics does raise its ugly head. And when you do try to interpret things that are discovered in the Middle East, you have to bear in mind that there are political um, influences at work to try and uh, not necessarily let the whole truth come out. Anyway, that's, that's all there. And the final point, which is probably a bit off the point there, is that the Edward, they did find another part of the Edward tablet which refers to a name very similar to one in the Old Testament, so that it appears as though the folks at Edward, who were an Akkadian empire, um, or certainly spoke the Akkadian language, were familiar with the same names or types of names as are used in the Old Testament. There is a link, again, this is where I'm coming from. The Old Testament is a book that goes back to the earliest parallel accounts from other places in the Middle East. Okay, so that's the point I'm trying to make, that I think there's sufficient evidence now that it is not a fable or not something that was generated from the Assyrian or the Babylonian fables at the time of the exile. Okay, that's where I'll cut now, because I've got a few more slides, but I think that's the, the major point I want to get across. Um, um... During your talk, um, you said you relied on various um, writers and they convinced you that this is why you believe that particular scenario. Um, I'll be in the devil's advocate at this point. Right. Um, do you believe on the um, basis of a wide reading of the evidence or is this what you want to believe and so you actually select which sources you read? Yes, uh, I would agree that the latter happens, and uh, to be honest, I would say that if I was looking for evidence, but evidence that was credible, that what I read in the Bible is supported by evidence. Now, I agree there's quite a deal of other evidence that would contradict what I put up there. Uh, but I am saying that there is there's some credible evidence that what I read in the Bible, and I look if I just go back to Genesis 11, I quote three or four external sources to support the timeline when Babylon was founded, and <coughs> at least the, the uh, I guess the plausibility of the uh, of the age of you know, the, the human population today. Uh, people in the time of flood. Okay. Um, I'll stop. I've got more questions, but I'll stop at this sort of point and to have you. I'll um, explain a bit related. Um, you haven't been through the normal institutions of learning to gather your knowledge about this. No. You've gone out there and found your own learning. 
you think you would have found it more difficult to do this had you been traditionally taught? It's interesting. I mean, I, I look, one of the uh, professors, uh, the professor from Liverpool, certainly cast doubt <coughs> on the uh, time on Back to the Club. He agrees he's got good support for probably back to the time when Time of Exodus onwards, if you believe that, but it's the Genesis account that he put down on. So I probably would have had doubts to cast in my mind if I'd sat under that professor. If I look at Clifford Wilson, a man who certainly has degrees, uh, with practical experience, he was a, a leader of a dig in Israel, was recognised uh, by archaeologists in Australia and once that was saying, I'm going to put it on there, as uh, the president of the Archaeological um, Association of Australia. Quite his peers, so he was recognised as having authority to speak on archaeology. And he certainly believes in the timeline by the mm. So I'm actually quoting my peers, not the. Well, I'm quoting, sorry, guys, who were the authorities, not from my own. So. <coughs> the reason I asked that question was that a lot of people who challenged me have come through a traditional education and haven't really educated themselves beyond that. Since they finished their degree, they haven't read a book on the subject. So. Oh, okay, so I took a slightly off. Yes, I've, I've read books. And I often feel to those people, I, I feel, why don't you go out and read this subject some more? You, you, you've lost contact with it. You haven't read what's been written in the last 15 years. But do you kind of read uh, like the stuff that they read? Um, say, uh, like the JD Peak theory uh, uh, developed by Wilhouse, which you uh, know of. Like, but have you uh, kind, of, kind of read, I put this question to both of you, have you kind of read uh, people who kind of support the late writing thesis? I've read a fair bit of this stuff, the JD Peak theory. Yeah. Not the About it? Or <laughs> by, by what sort of authors? By those who actually believed in it or by those who are opposing it? By those who believe in it. Um, I don't think it's right. I think it's much more. I, you know, I, I, I agree. Um, I'm, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying a uh, question whether people actually read widely and read uh, opposing views, or do they just kind of pick the sources that they want to read because they want to believe what those authors say? For example, I was talking to a geology trained person with a PhD in geology. And I had the impression they hadn't read their subject much lately, they work in a different field now. And I was talking with him again recently and found that he had visited some asteroid crater sites in the Flinders Ranges. And he was astounded, very interested in them. And his formal training would never have admitted that such a thing happened. But he has since read more and learn that there is a whole new world to learn about that he was never taught in his own training. And uh, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about, son. Yeah, well, you're saying other people have a problem. The mm. question is, do we have a problem? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure we do. Yeah. It's a matter of being widely read and well read in every area, but my definition of education has never been to learn your one field up, 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 up. To really increase your education, you've got to read every field out in all the directions. It's like a pyramid of knowledge. You can't build a tall, skinny tower and call yourself educated. You've got to build a wide, strong pyramid of knowledge in every area. Yeah. All right. Um, I've actually pulled up um, Deuteronomy 34 um, on the screen here. And um, at. Um, this is the last chapter of Deuteronomy, it's the end of the Pentateuch. And um, in, the Pentate uh, in Deuteronomy, especially, you get a number of indications that the book was actually written many years after the events. And for instance, here, uh, the final chapter says, Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those signs and wonders the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> That was Simon. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, um, 
who did all this, those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do. So, um, um, so that's an indication that at least that section was written a number of years uh, after the event. You know, another one thing I've heard, how, I, I, I'm not convinced, how does that indication it's written much later? Well, because it's saying, it's saying, since then no prophet has risen in oh, Israel oh, oh, I, I, like Moses. I'm, 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 so the inference is that, so that it was written a number of years yeah. afterwards. Is that right. Right. Because it's like the end, like in the Sorry? Is, is that possible like an add-on at the end? Oh, right, um, that's a possibility. Obviously, yeah, obviously um, Moses did not write the last chapter of Deuteronomy because it describes his death. It could have been written 20 years after the main text. Right. And yeah. that wouldn't ruin it very much, would it? Um, okay, okay. Uh, to some other things. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, uh, it says these are the words that Moses spoke when he was on the other side of the shore. I have no doubt that Moses had a lot of scholars doing the work mm. and he was an editorial director of it in right. some respect. And also, um, there's, uh, and uh, that phrase is repeated in the last chapter where it uh, says it refers to what Moses did on the other side of the Jordan. So the book was written on the, um, after they crossed the Jordan. Um, and also the, a number of phrases in there which say, to this day. Right. Well, the same is going to be added to Joshua at the end. Yeah. So there are a lot of references in, in the, virtually all of the historical books. Uh, from uh, like uh, the, all of the Pentateuch, mm-hmm. also Joshua, Judges, mm-hmm. Ruth, Samuel, <laughs> Kings, and all that sort of thing, and uh, where it's uh, where you get an indication that the book was written years after the event, because it says, "And to this day, such and such a monument is still living." Uh, but but but, but that, doesn't, that doesn't define how many years. Yeah. Isn't there somewhere in the in the Old Testament in a few phrases that talks about? The what people think of the scribes in Babylon, and that they had other other texts yeah. from previous. So Moses, I'm not saying this is right, but Moses and, and all these others are talking about perhaps the people who sinned and from until this day were scribes in Babylon writing the writing the texts out to make well, editing it after the event. E- editing, yeah. yeah to, that's make, to use it to give uh, yeah, Israel who had been captured uh, a history or or to, to give them an identity so that they can move on without their temple and stuff. So that wouldn't be contradicted then, would it? No. It no. Actually, a lot of the talk that aren't in that book, the um, and another verse was that Moses was the most common man in the world. Yeah. Moses is unlikely to be that. But I think there's there's a lot of agreement amongst um, current scholarship that the Idyllic period was the time when the final redaction was done and um, these scriptures were handed down orally and we don't understand the old tradition um, we, we can't get our heads around it but it was a very strong tradition a strong tradition one and the in exile um, they thought long and hard about who they were and where on earth they're going to go from now and so they needed to bring it all together and they did the final redaction and they, they had the same yeah, that, that brings to my question I was going to ask is when did um, the Hebrew, I presume, you know, is a presented type language? I mean, it, it is, it, yeah, it's, it's based on sound rather than it's some of those sound. ancient ones which are just simply symbols for things. Mm. And so. That's a bit not picturesque. Mm, so, therefore, um, my interpretation is that those, the, the Old Testament can only be written in that phonetic sense if it's going to be written. Or handed down from an old tradition where the writing is available. And does anybody know the date when did when that happened? And when um, the Egyptians, you know, got the writing, got paper and started writing for it? Yeah, I know, but I, it, we were quoting years ago. Yeah, that's that's important. Important. I mean, that's an important thing. I would show you the Sumerian, you know, Kings list, which certainly don't have yeah. the same Yeah, but it's not phonetic, it's, uh, it hasn't got the ability to. Describe stories and it hasn't got the ability to, to, write, to write beautiful things like the songs of song. The songs, you know what I mean? It wasn't po- it's poetic, it's the Psalms, it's, there's poetry there that you can't do with simple um, the text that was earlier, that was in the early form. 
You're comparing it with the Egyptian cuneiform, for example. Like yes, that's right. Yeah, which so clearly. Um, so I'm trying to figure out. Well, when was that? When did that occur? Uh, it was close to the end of around 2000. And, and, yes. And they got they got ancient Egyptian. And they and they learned to write phonetically yeah. rather than. Yeah. Okay. The Hebrew is obviously a sophisticated language. Uh, sorry, written language. Well, in the ancient language, so it's back to the point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right, they have, you know, they have one word, um, seven different forms of it, given the slightly different shape of the volume going on. And yeah, so we don't actually have that in English. Yeah. But we've got variations in, in, in some of the things. There's Pappy's alphabet in there, that they found, uh, I think it was on a television thing I watched, and, it, and they found a stone somewhere. <laughs> In this way, <coughs> and uh, they've chiseled on it the old ancient Hebrew alphabet. That's the alphabet, and it goes. They keep putting it back. It goes back. They reckon it's very close to the time of the thousand BC, the time of uh, King David, just a little bit before. And there's some puzzle that you can you can test it somehow rather, and it puts it in this David's uh, reign or just a bit uh, after something of that sort. But uh, that would indicate that they're right, wouldn't it? Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's right. I say, remember what the king keeps saying, and I might read quite a little bit, keeps saying, oh, by the way, you look in the annals yes. of the kings of such and such, you mm. find the expansion of this. So it appears there were some parallel accounts somewhere there. Yes, that. That would be used but, by a right. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm totally agreeing with you. I'm not, there's no, that, this is really wanting to know more okay. and to understand when such so big could be put down on paper. It had to be put on paper and uh, rather than baked into clay or something. Yeah. I mean, Jeremiah yeah. had hard money, right? That was some land. Well, yeah, um, would it be possible that there were prior written records and they were collated together and um, uh, edited? Um, so you had edited written records rather than just uh, edited oral tradition. Mm-hmm. We seem to think that things need to be written and put on paper. Mm-hmm. Um, and for them to be enduring and um, you know set in stone, but that's actually not the case. So let's somehow get our heads around that. I, I don't, you know, we know that certainly Jeremiah is just lots of different things. Homer's Iliad is is that when was that pen? About 700 was it or when was it written? Yeah, you're you're right. 700 BC. So was there? There is um. I'm sorry, I'm very interested in. The understanding of ancient languages. Uh, some of us today take the reading of Egyptian hieroglyphs as um, old hat, but that was only worked out recently. And there's many other languages that have only been worked out more recently than that. And reading a book recently, I discovered there are still three very prominent archaeological languages that we don't have hardly any understanding of at all. There's one language we haven't got a clue how to even begin interpreting what it says, and yet we have a lot of records written in it, and it's a European language uh, around the Mediterranean. That's hard for me to believe that there's so much stuff written in this language and we have no idea what it is. That's what you get from killing the thinkers of that language. (laughs) (laughs) But there was a lag in a documentary on television recently, the interpretation of the um, South American, is it the Az- not the Aztecs, it's another group. Their language was only broken about 12 or 15 years ago. And this lad, who was about 12, 14, 16, 18 years old, was going with his mother down to the archaeological sites in South America on holiday with her, he, he was just tag along when she was on the job. And he started getting interested in some of the other scholars of that language and talking with them all and hearing their different views on how this language worked. And he got the idea that none of them knew how it worked. And then one day he actually solved it. He realised that they were using two symbols together for a phonetic sound. And they had a set of about 20 or 30 symbols which could substitute for the same one. So the two symbols together, when people tried to decode it that way, 
they had far too many symbols. For phonetic language, there were hundreds and thousands of symbols that wouldn't be a phonetic language. But if 40 of them say the same sound, it does start getting meaningful. And they've since learned how to even speak this language. And the people in South America are actually now relearning their ancient language. Um, just for the fun of it. Like the Australians in the pocket. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so which, which country? Um, Peru? Ah, Ecuador. I'm getting too old. We will get dragged off this about to try and watch that. The fact that you actually have um, parallels between what's in the Bible and what's in um, ancient, other ancient records like, for instance, the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh has a flood, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and uh, that's interesting, but what does it prove? Uh, because uh, the other spin you could actually put on it is uh, that they, uh, the biblical writers just grabbed the myths that were floating around and adapted them for, uh, for yes. Yahweh. Well, I, I mean, that's right towards the end. I was trying to make the point by looking at the Bible tablets, which don't come to about 42 BC, but the uh, made the reference, if you like, to the New Testament um, as well. We generally accept the first book, the Gospels that we have, as being early accounts of what we believe the foundation, uh, whereas we could see the Gnostic Gospels written 200, whatever, uh, AD as being much more embellished. Uh, I was applying the same, what's the right word, the earliest accounts. And I believe even Herodotus's history, history um, excuse me, I must sort of repeat myself, I said it a few times before, are known, people have read them, say that within 100 or 200 years when he wrote accounts of what happened over 200 years, yes, I think that's believable. If you get much past that, and you start to forget embellishments. Yeah. Like well, yeah, I think what you, 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 you presented a good case yes. to say that the, the Old Testament uh, Corresponded to uh, stories that were old. Old and yeah. simple. Old yeah, old and simple. simple, all right. Yeah. So they were, so you, you provide an argument to show that they weren't written late. Yeah. Um, but, but, all right, so we accept that mm-hmm. they're old yeah. and they parallel other old stories of the time. The old does, does, that doesn't make them true, does it? No, you're no. right. It, you're right. It, it, it does not. It, it does not. Um, there is actually, sorry. I was just going to put a question line, but there are striking differences between the ancient Near East stories and actually um, the biblical text of creation. A lot of people say it's polemical, it's an argument against other creation stories. Um, in the biblical text, the, the border, in the Ark, in the um, in Numash, the big Babylonian story, the Numash, the Numash, the Numash, yeah, the Numash, the Numash, um, the um, creation comes about as a result of chaos. Man is created because the God wants someone to serve him, and it's just it's just a mess. And you can and people say, well, you know, this is the same. It's not. It's hugely different. What God creates is good. There's order. Man is elevated. He's um, in the image of God. The, the differences are, are just chalk and cheese. And then people um, argue that the Bible is just taking stories from from what I read in the Ark shape, um, the Ark shape was the cube of the Ark of Gilgamesh. I feel it's um, was it one or size um, from what I read. Right? It was a cube shape, and so like it, it looked like it was actually oh, done a, uh, a model of it, and actually the tumble was like a cube of the top of the water. But they, but the fact was the Ark shape was perfect design. Um, I think it is kind of important. I think mean, that uh, Kevin Helen probably didn't know him too. There was just so much in this topic which I was skimming on. Uh, that was obvious that if you feel that we can have further sessions on the Old Testament, um, there are others who would probably have a lot more justice than I could. Yeah, well, uh, and and we, might, we might uh, follow Matt's advice and invite him in the passage. Come on. Yes. <laughs> Some of you, it goes a bit, uh, you didn't cover those, you didn't get to those chapters. Uh, but it sort of bothers me, again, I watch a lot of documentary, 
And he, his wild Finkelstein, the fellow, and it seems a bit of a radical, but uh, what he, he talks about the Exodus, and uh, he's strict of it, he says that there's no way it could be 10 million people. He got all sorts of reasons, and the kitchen economy was wrong. But in the in those uh, the books of Joshua, um, it gives an account of how they took over the land by destroying the city states and stuff like that. But at that time, his argument with, is that the Canaan was actually a um, occupied by the Egyptians. It was a province of, of Egypt, and the Egyptians were there. And they, they have forts in the Egyptian forts, warehouses, and that show their presence from the 15th century, so I think it's around about the 11th century, some of that sort. Of. And then, then there are hundreds of letters written by the kings of these uh, city states that, um, that, that they found in Egypt, they've been sent to Egypt, and the kings are prostrating themselves before the Pharaoh eight times on this. Like you can see it on the internet as well. And then um, they ask the permission for the king to go to war against the, their neighbours and pain and then and there's all sorts of arguments like that. And that goes from the 15th, about the 15th century to the 11th century, somewhere in the just before that uh, century. And they were there in power. And how Joshua went through there, and in the Joshua Account, there's not a single word mentioned about the Egyptians being there. Look, there are problems. Okay. I, and I know Kevin will have a little bit of discussion on this. The Egyptian history that has become, certainly the, the accepted history, is based on uh, an Egyptian priest called Manetho around about 200 BC who wrote a history of Egypt as he knew it, and obviously had. Athletics. <coughs> but it was written about 200 BC, hereabouts, if you correct it, um, Ptolemy II. It was quite a late description, and he gives a list of the different pharaohs and different dynasties he wrote. But his original writing has never actually been copied. What we have is, I believe, three of the examples of people who wrote what they thought he wrote. And many of these. And I think all three of those were written, um, the copies that we have of them are many hundreds of years after the original copy. So, in one sense, what we based all of our Egyptian history and our acceptance that it was a serial, I think that's been the main, um, with those perhaps on the more conservative side, I would say, um, there's been a, a major assumption, a leap in faith, that, that the Egyptian Pharaoh list that we have, it was all serial, one after the other, and it pushes Egyptian history way back uh, and distorts Egyptian history when it's tried to be compared with other things. In particular, I think the Hittites is the one where not only does the Bible say the Hittites were around about the time of about 800 BC, uh, Assyrian records from Nineveh also say Hittites were strong in the um, with this, um, Record down the middle actually gives a, a Hittite in this. Whereas if you believe the Manetho's account, or rather interpretation of his account, Egyptian history says, no, 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 the Hittites died out about 1200 BC. So we got the Bible and the Ninevites saying, no, they were around 800 BC. And then we have this almost infallible Egyptian history by it, which is, seems to be used the ruler for much of the account of the Middle East. Some have been found being contradicted by two other sources. So, I myself, being corrected and somewhat dubious about the Egyptian history when it's used as placed as a ruler over other accounts, because as I say, both the Syrians as well as the Bible, in, in terms of the Hittites, seem to be contradicting when the Hittites are Well, I, I know that uh, I don't think the sources that uh, Israel put. Uh, doesn't take any of those those texts. He takes the archaeology. So, for example, um, Pithom and Ramses, where the last cities that the, the Hebrews were in before they they left, they they couldn't find Ramses for a long time. Very finally, they found him in a place called Tanis, 
with about 20 or so miles away. So they had taken all the, ob the objects of Ramses and taken them over to Tannis, and that's why they couldn't find them ever. So eventually they found, they found where that place was. And what had happened is that the tributary of the Nile had dried up. Therefore they come along and they dig down there and find the little bugs there that died. And the last ones that died you can be thankful to give you an idea of, of pants. And that's somewhere in the 12th century BC. The other way of knowing when it all happened is that the Bible says that from the time of, of uh, of the Exodus to the building of the temple was whatever number it was. Years years and years that puts us around about the 15th temple. Yeah, around, I think it's 14th century. 14th century. Yeah. Around, yeah, well, it's 1500. Around, around about those dates. Yeah. And so that's got nothing to do with whatever anyone else thought about King. It's, it's perhaps my memory, more absolute faith on that. And uh, they, those are the two possibilities of the Exodus. One to fit in with the the town and one to fit in with the group over there, and it's during those times that these tablets were written during that whole time, showing the presence of Egypt there. And therefore, the Joshua coming in would have had to exchange a few shots with the Egyptians because they were determined to protect Egypt's borders from other characters, so they had to bump the stuff. And um, how, how can that be? A couple of issues with that. Um, firstly, if Israel left Egypt the way the Bible says it happened, then, as you mentioned earlier, the Egyptian economy was shot at that time, and Egypt was shot as a power. So there would have been roughly that 40 years between when Israel left Egypt and when they arrived in Canaan, where the Canaanites would have been effectively independent of Egypt. Yeah. So if Egypt would have well, sure had control prior to that. Um, but from that point, we've had 40 years of Canaan life doing what they like. Even and after the of Joshua didn't come into without having to worry about a difference in the land. 100 years after Joshua came in, in the, as I remember, their tablets dated from that time, still talking of the, the Pharaoh about it. Again, the further back we go in time, the uh, more nebulous our dating gets. And there's a kind of controversy amongst historians about it. Uh, Egyptian history, which is raging violently now, and there's 450 and 500 years separating the different dating methods they use. So there's article after article after article appearing in journal diaries, which uh, display this um, conjecture over Egyptian times. One of the things that I find um, Frustrating when I read the Bible, God keeps on talking about Pharaoh, yes. but never names him. No. <laughs> <laughs> but wouldn't it be great if the biblical writers had actually said which Pharaoh they were talking uh, about? Uh, that's that's right. Right. We did get one, and that's in the uh, book of Kings. We read it. About Pharaoh Deco. That comes in. Yeah. Yes, but that, that, that's, that's much later. It is, right. Yeah, yeah there's two, two dates. Mm -hmm. I might be early and the later. And there's really no of them really uh, in the Well, there's a lot of people who deny that the, it occurred at all or that Joshua and Judges is completely. Yeah, yeah. 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 most those who do think it's happened, um, they, they, they put two points in the Professor, professor of Egyptology, you know, Paul Wright, or you can refer to. More or less the setting of the, the type of the, um, uh, the treaty that come and do. Separately, it says it, it dates Ramses, because then he dates it, says it was talked about Ramses being the city. And he gave, I think he said, the 12th or 13th century is yeah. the date for the Exodus, for the, the time of that box. So, no, I th think the situation is uh, like you can get. Um, um, attestation from other sources outside the Bible for the events that happened in Israel uh, from the time of David on. Um, like, uh, any other references to David, I think we might just be one little clue. Um, and before David, it's a complete black hole in terms of uh, getting identification of specific people from other sources. 
and so it kind of expands uh, later and so that by the time you get to Omri you get uh, a lot of records about Omri outside the Bible uh, but uh, prior to David nothing so from that point on we were actually reliant on the sort of argument that you came up with to say what happened then was typical of what happened then mm-hmm. even though there's no explicit reference to names within the structure that's really hard the interesting thing is you mentioned this fellow who lived around Finkelstein did not believe in David. Right. No, no evidence for it, no archaeological evidence of the existence of David. Mm. And he wrote the Rock of Kings and he talked about it. One day his assistant was out doing some survey in the Israel, and as she was she, she being called back, as she was coming back, she found saw this stone with some writing on it, which was part of a stealer, and it was written by the kings of Damascus, saying and I came up against kings with huge armies and chariots and and chariots and all the rest of it. And uh, I slew them all, and I slew the sons of this and that and the other thing of the house of David. Yeah, that's the one. Yep, bingo. Yeah, 840 BC. Yeah, that's that one. David, since about 1990, the name of David has occurred about three or four times now. Even Egypt is. So the DWT was the DWD was the uh, the Aramaic way of talking about David. And then there's a translation DWT, uh, which has started to emerge in a couple of Egyptian cases, and they recognise T and D can be interchangeable in the consonants, and that was probably mm-hmm. in David as well. So David is a real historical person, really historical. but he, Saul is yet to justify himself. He he uh, he just says, well, David did exist, but he wasn't a big deal at the moment. Right. So, uh, yeah. uh, the other thing at that time, both I found about him is that both um, in some big deposits, so both Egypt and Syria were in decline. Assyria records, which later on describe a lot of what happened in the Levant and Palestine, the Assyrians didn't have not advanced the Mediterranean at that time because they were so weak. So they, there's no description of anything that happened in that area. So it's not that they didn't exist, but rather that the people who did keep records just weren't in that area at the time. The people who did keep records were the ones who saw the Bible. Yeah, well that's true. There was one for, there was one record for the time. Another question I had that you referred to the Sumerian kings. Now that also relates to what you're saying about uh, other stories being far more fantastic than what's in the Bible. And I know they had ages of thousands, ten thousand, twenty thousand years for all of that. But uh, you said that there's a way of calculating that to bring it back to the same. There is a controversy at the yeah. moment that what they, I believe they can, I stand corrected here, but I believe they can recognise numbers and things. Clifford Wilson made the point that up to now they've interpreted each indication of unit of uh, the length of time is a 360 year interval. Six additional system is a very useful one, it's not a three or two or whatever. But they're saying, well, what happens if we are in fact using 10 digits for those units of time? Suddenly the 360 years is now 10 years long and certainly has transposed it. In fact, no, this was added Wikipedia. It was what it was, and it said that if you allow for a different interpretation of units of time, then the king list back to the time of the flood is only 200 years out from what the Bible says it is. Which is the same, if you'd like a precision year by year by year, when it was born, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a couple of hundred years. And this is the cut of Sumerian numbers is divided by 36, is that what you said? That's what no, I said. The, the, the but base is 60, yeah, uh, as I understand it. And that's why we've got 60 seconds and 60 minutes. Directly from that time. Look, I, 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 I believe that I've not got much evidence <coughs> except to say that that's what Clifford Wilson, Dr. Clifford Wilson did say, um, the interpretation of an archaeologist that, that he believes that he could make that comparison by using different numbers. I mean, it, it's, for me, when I realised the 360, like the very sixties, so it's so close to perhaps the, what they thought was the, a, a year. Mm-hmm. It's three fifty, but we really do call it now. Pretty close. It is, and that's of course, of course, yeah. it is. Yeah. And, in, 
and their logic from this we have yet to interpret it as uh, being um, what we were saying there just before um, that uh, Ray was saying just before that there are some languages no one can for down that the way they count the units or something or indeed in our case we sometimes use binary systems sometimes we use decimal systems the day you have different numbering systems depending on what you just don't know yet mm. so, so six is a day in that system could be, could be. Or six is a day. It could be. I don't know. Uh, and I'd stand corrected because anyone here that knows the, um, you know, the Sumerian numbering system, I'll be. 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 i will be 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 Trying to contain, you know, so just to have that in the back of your mind and trying to correlate. I feel like the majority of the witness, I mean, I guess I come from a very conservative viewpoint. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I acknowledge that your lecture is probably a little more qualified than mine, but the majority of the witness history. Yeah, you did say not to discredit it, but just be a student. Its purpose is to be writing history, although yeah. we're, what does include history, the history is expected. I mean, I would accept the Psalms are not history. They do the witness prayers and so on. So a lot of safe things, witness history. Um, none of the places Exodus is witness history. Yeah, but it's history that is in. You look at, oh. you look at Kings and Post Chronicles, you know, the same, same scenario, you've got very different things. Uh, well, certainly Chronicles. Look at different newspapers today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you know, Genesis had a, there was a, there was a very, um, Look, and, and obviously we, there will be different views on, on Genesis chapters 1 through, certainly 1 through 3 at least. Um, 4 and 5 start the same as on witness history, or at least as a group of names of people, and we do have a correlation with some of the at least from chapter 4 onwards as far as that is concerned. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's, it's not this year, but I'm saying that an historical document would, would come at things differently because there's a process that you would um, undergo when you write an historical document. Historical documents as such didn't really start to be thought of that way until the last couple of years ago. Mm. Mm. What you said before, that um, four or five hundred years ago they were considered history. Um, the science of history, one of a better term, um, but the, how you write things historically wasn't really starting to develop about 500 years ago. Um, prior to that, things were written as they were done different ways, different slants, uh, different ideas as to what it all means. In other words, they didn't use modern historical methods. That's right. But there, there was still a historical method employed, you know, Josephus had an approach that was Mm. That's definitely because it wasn't the model. Mm. But I mean, nobody, nobody expects to believe everything he says either because he has a scientist in his mm. yeah. yeah. and he thinks this got started in Egypt. Mm. So, yeah, but that's understood when you read some of it. Mm. We're now more sophisticated, we would read between the lines. But uh, um, they would have been too. Yes, they would have been too, yes, that's exactly right. There are things you couldn't say, perhaps, which you would require. Yeah. There's one area where the Bible does differ significantly from other ancient historical records, and that is that, as a general rule, historical records built up the good things, the great things, the successes, and touched up the negatives. And whereas the Bible tends to bring out the negatives a lot more as well. Well, Chronicles did that. Chronicles touched up everything about the mm -hmm. Greek kings. So yeah, yeah, so Chronicles is more the political viewpoint. Kings is more the uh, prophetic viewpoint. Yeah. Yeah. The only idea is that so the Jews only believed in one God, and in ancient times, uh, the New Testament the founding fathers became gods, and the writers of this were determined that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the rest of them were not going to become gods. So that's why they were, all the blemishes were there. Yes. Are you saying that's an explanation that 
Yeah, so that's Stephen Croft, he's a noisy <laughs> he, he, he has a go at the writers of the Old Testament as if there are a lot of butchers and hooligans and, and idiots, and he, pre- he presents them, you know, uh, Timmy Bob when he went into Egypt gave his, his wife something like yeah. the Pharaoh and all this sort of thing, and what a big walks lot that they are. But it, 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 it may well have been, but the scriptures show them as big walks lot. Because they don't want these people to become gods. So they don't mm. become gods. And but they want, on the other right. hand, they want to show us what our God is like. Mm. It's not about heroes of faith, it's about mm. a God who loves us, irrespective of what we do or. Right. It's, 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 it's a mm. pet rotation of the people of God. You're talking about Stephen Fry, the British bloke. Yeah, the mm. British bloke. Yeah. What shows did he run? What show? Well, he runs this uh, quiz show now. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, well, I was a program channel for a long time. Yeah. Stephen Fry was back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There was a British um, woman who used to video confrontations between her and people on the street about the gospel. Um, she was pretty straightforward on it. And um, in one of the episodes she had, she met Stephen Fry. In a very short time, Stephen Fry got really, really angry and was shouting off in all sorts of ways. It's very interesting to watch. (laughs) (laughs) Any other questions or comments? Alright, well, it's ten past nine, so we'll uh, call it a night. Uh, Thank you very much for the presentation. Mm -hmm. Being able to put up with (laughs) the devil acted.